Bine v-am regăsit, doamnelor și domnilor, la Eurodicționar. Facem această ediție cu o ediție specială filmată în data în care la Chișinău s-a desfășurat summitul regional pentru probleme de securitate organizat în comun de Georgia, Ucraina și Republica Moldova. Foarte multe personalități au participat și este cu adevărat cum să spun, spectaculos pentru noi că domnul Damon Wilson, care este vicepreședintele executiv al Atlantic Council, unul dintre patronii principale ai acestui summit, a acceptat invitația de a fi alături de noi, chiar dacă nu am apucat să stabilim în prealabil lucrurile. Și dacă vi se pare că puțin, puțin chestiune par improvizată, să fiți înțelegători, vă rugăm, pentru că a fost cu adevărat un eveniment impresionant și cred că e bine să auzim cum arată această regiune din mai multă perspectivă. Cu domnul Wilson vom discuta în engleză, așa că am să vă rog să îngăduiți acest lucru și să urmăriți subtitrarea. Well, Mr. Wilson, uh, welcome to our show and thank you very much for accepting this on the spot without any previous preparations of this interview. Christian, it's my pleasure to be with you today and to be with your audience, so thank you for having me on. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, you've been attending this, uh, this very important summit. Uh, What would you think in, would be, in your opinion, the main challenges of the Black Sea region, uh, and, and especially involving Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova? Exactly. That's why we're here in Chisinau as part of this summit, as part of this forum, um, because we think that what's playing out in this region is of utmost importance. It's not just a struggle for Moldova, for Ukraine, for Georgia. What's playing out right here is the, the, the friction point between the free world and the model of authoritarian kleptocracy represented by the Kremlin. And we see very much the importance of this region as really a frontier of freedom right now, and where the people of Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, very different countries, but they share the same common struggle of being able to determine their own future. And that's partly why we're here to stand in solidarity with these three countries and their populations Um, behind the simple idea that they get to determine their own future. When you speak about the influences of an authoritarian uh, regime such as the one from Kremlin, um, some would try to understand by that that there is a kind of a hybrid war which goes against everything uh, connected to democracy or democratic uh, wishes such as those of Ukraine, Moldova and uh, Georgia. Uh, what would you exactly point out of, out of this hybrid war by, by being the most um, complicated challenges and most dangerous ones? So sure, I think part of this is that we, I mean, there's no doubt there's a hybrid war that's been under, under uh, way here in, in Moldova, uh, but as well as in Georgia and Ukraine, throughout Europe, and even in the United States, as you've seen from media coverage of that. Um, but the problem is, is it's a hybrid war combined with the fact that these are hostage nations. There's occupied territory still in these three nations. That sort of brings them together in this common, uh, common cause of being blocked and where they want to go. Uh, it's exacerbated by what we see in a hybrid war. This is a vehicle, you know, a vehicle that are, uh, we see coming emanating out of Russia, playing in some respects, sometimes a weak hand playing it quite well. Uh, thinking about how to actually create confusion, to so play on the vulnerabilities that are uh, natural in a, any democratic society, to exploit those vulnerabilities, to cause question and to cause doubt about our own direction, our own resolve, lack of trust in our own institutions. And so we've got a, a bit of a struggle underway. How do we, uh, re how do we have, uh, renew our own institutions, have confidence in our own model of open market democracies, whether in the United States, throughout Europe, or here in Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, while at the same time being very clear that the struggle we face is a bigger struggle. It is a struggle between what wants to be the free world and that pushback from authoritarian kleptocracy as an alternative model. You've said before, and you are totally right, that the three countries that are here uh, in Chisinau together, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, Uh, share differences, but also share some common problems. That's For right. example, the conflicts, occupied territories, uh, and also a territory that has been illegally um, actually annexated by Russia. Right. I'm speaking about Crimea right now. Ukraine also has an on-raging uh, war in Donbass, and uh, Georgia and Moldova, they have semi-frozen conflicts, actually, on their own territories. Do you think that the military issue Uh, could become worse? Do you see any uh, dangerous development of this situation, for example, after the uh, presidential elections in Russia? Mm -hmm. 
look, I think we see a dangerous development that we've had a much more aggressive posture out of the Kremlin. This is, uh, there's almost a conflict that uh, Mr. Putin has helped create that the, that the United States and its allies in Europe were not looking for. Uh, to be frank, in the United States, Washington has been much more focused on uh, the real challenges coming out of the Middle East, the, the wars across the Middle East, uh, combined with really uh, global systemic changes driven by the rise of China. That had been really the frame of reference for the United States. It's not as if Americans were sitting here planning and thinking about uh, 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 Russia and its military activities. Mr. Putin, in many respects, has created a crisis, has fueled a crisis by his actions in the neighborhood, um, not just the occupation of uh, continued Russian forces in Transnistria and also on the Georgian territories, uh, but as you said, because of a hot war in Ukraine, an actual invasion of its neighbor and the annexation of Crimea, combined with a much more aggressive posture vis-a-vis -vis our NATO allies in the Baltic states, Romania and Bulgaria. So for many Americans, this has been a little bit, uh, a bit of a surprise that this wasn't really our worldview. We weren't worried about or planning about the Kremlin in Washington. We were focused on the Middle East and, and Asia. And here Mr. Putin, through his activities, has really generated crises. So I am worried about the military equation, precisely because we've seen a Russian conventional and nuclear military buildup on the uh, uh, borders of our, our alliance, uh, because we've seen more assertive and aggressive policy uh, by the Kremlin vis-a-vis uh, -vis its neighbors. Uh, as you mentioned, a hot war in Ukraine that continues today. Uh, and because we've seen this very cavalier uh, bravado from Mr. Putin himself, as we saw yesterday, uh, almost chest thumping about Russia's nuclear arsenal, um, which I can only take as a really a means to intimidate, uh, intimidate others, perhaps coerce its neighbors. Uh, and I find that very worrying and very disturbing. Uh, do you think that Mr. Putin is trying to stage up a situation like um, some decades before with the um, Cuban Missile Crisis, he will build up tensions uh, up to the uh, explosion point and then simply relax things and try to negotiate with the, with the West and regain a position? So, you know, look, it's hard to put yourself in the, the mind of uh, Mr. Putin, but it strikes me that there are two things that are happening. Um, one, I very much suspect that Russian foreign policy is a function of domestic policy, uh, that at the end of the day, this is about how does Mr. Putin maintain a sense of legitimacy for his own uh, uh, authoritarian kleptocrat rule of Russia. Uh, and the old bargain of stay, telling people basically, you stay out of politics and we'll keep rising the, raising the level of, of prosperity of the country, that formula is, is gone. The Russian economy is not really carrying the Russian people forward. And so faced with uh, that uncertainty on the economic front, We've seen him double down on this narrative of nationalism and strength, and that I think he's used and instrumentalized his relationship with Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, where he can be tough, as a way of trying to rally support at home as he goes into an election period, as he wants to demonstrate that he sustains the support of the Russian people, almost helping to tell the Russian people, look, you face a real danger, and only I can protect Mother Russia when the reality is that's ludicrous. There was no threat to Russia coming from the West, the United States, Europe. This is almost a fabricated conflict on his part, I think, to help justify his rule at home. On the international front, I think you're right. Um, I suspect that he is looking to push, probe, and to exploit our weaknesses or our ambiguities. Um, I think Vladimir Putin knows not to have a direct face-off with the United States. That's not a game he can win, and it's not a game he will play. But I think he will be interested in where can he maneuver and play where we might be distracted. We might not be all in the game. And can he exploit some of those things and come at us in a, a not a head-on-head -head confrontation with the United States, but that indirect. That's why we've seen these hybrid warfare tactics. Uh, and I, I don't think he will push it to the edge. I don't think he can afford a direct confrontation with the United States. The question for us is how much can we take uh, of this indirect challenge that's been coming from the Kremlin? Yes, this is indeed the question, and the question also refers to the three countries, uh, I mean, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. Can they face uh, on their own this, uh, this uh, hybrid war which rages on from Russia in these parts of the world? Because they are somehow seeking for, for, um, for help, actually. It's a cry out for, for help, for support from the West. Is the West 
and I'm, in, I'm referring now to the European on one hand and the United States on the other hand, willing and able to support uh, these countries so, they, so that they would not fall back into the, the arms of Russia? Well, there are two components here. First of all, for myself uh, at the Atlantic Council, I believe, believe very firmly that uh, the United States, our European allies, our North American allies should be standing with to support Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova in their struggle. That said, I think that we sometimes underestimate the agency, the, the power of the people of these countries themselves. Imagine for a moment that the United States and Europe had nothing to do with these countries. I firmly believe that the people of Georgia, the people of Ukraine, the people of Moldova, we see this on, this, on Ukraine today, that faced with a Russian effort to overplay its hand, to really take over territory, to cause influence, it's created an extraordinary backlash. We see a stronger sense of Ukrainian identity, a stronger sense of resolve to push back against uh, the Russian invasion and the insurgency that it has fueled uh, in the southeast of Ukraine. Um, and I think that really speaks to the fact that this isn't just rhetoric. The actions that people take in Moldova, in Georgia and Ukraine, the actions that they take will have as much to do with their own future and the much to do with curbing the influence of what Russia can get away with in this neighborhood. Now, that's not an excuse for Europe or the United States to back off. In fact, I think it's an argument for the Europeans and the Americans to lean in, and we have to have something to support. And so we need to be able to support competent uh, uh, governments, uh, uh, reforming governments that have the ability to build the resilience of their own populations uh, to withstand influence from abroad, while also giving opportunities for their own people at home. We need something to support. But that said, I think there is a very moral cause for the United States to be standing by small countries, smaller countries, that are really trying to determine their future. Before getting to specificity of Moldova, on the whole, do you find uh, governments in Moldova, Ukraine, and uh, Georgia to support? Are you satisfied with the activity and the uh, results of the three governments? Uh, in my view, um, we work with uh, all, all the governments as they, you know, we have in the past, we will in the future. Um, my posture is that the United States is not here to pick and choose winners and losers. Um, the Atlantic Council is not here to pick and choose particular individuals or parties. We are here to demonstrate support for the aspirations of these three countries and their populations. And we are gonna work with decision makers in these capitals, no matter uh, who they are, when they are. Uh, this is an important sort of fabric, I think, component to our work. And so in, the many, in many respects, um, what I think I'm really pleased to see is a clarity of purpose, a clarity of objective, with these capitals being very clear that they see their future and the, in, the, in the context of being a part of the free world. They see their future as part of the European family of nations, as part of the transatlantic community. That strategic clarity, in my view, is an opening, an invitation for us to provide that support. Um, as it comes in terms of the process at home, look, this is messy. This is difficult. We are going through historic transformations. You know that far better than I do. Two steps forward, one step back. We have seen this across the region. Uh, I guess my perspective on this is we will always want to support and expect more of our partners in these three countries because the more they succeed at home of accelerating their own reform agenda, of helping to transform and create modern European societies uh, within their boundaries, it gives us something more to support. Um, and so we're always going to want to see more. The European Union, of course, has its policy more for more. I think that's a very good formula. Uh, but I guess my, my key point is this isn't about any one government or one, one individual. I think we need a more coherent transatlantic strategy that is very much committed to this idea that there will not be a permanent gray zone of ambiguity, of indecision in this region. That is a formula for malaise at best, conflict at worst. It's in, I think, the interest of these nations, but it's also in our interests to see that you're, you have the right to pursue your aspirations and that we do everything possible to help you achieve those. Now getting to Moldova, to, to the end of our discussion, before you've given the example of Ukraine, speaking about the, the way the Ukrainian people, for example, is coherent about its struggle, 
Uh, some would say that the, the Russian aggression was the real birth of the Ukrainian nation. But coming to Moldova, uh, we can see that there is a strong division within the society, and not only, a strong division even in politics. Now, the president looks one way, the parliament and government, uh, they look the other way. Um, parties fight among themselves. There is opposition even with, uh, within the pro-European um, current, if I may say so. What is your assessment about the situation in Moldova right now and about its perspectives, thinking of the fact that this is an electoral uh, year? Th there will be elections, parliamentary elections in the, in the autumn. Sure, sure. And look, there's always an element of uncertainty associated with elections. That's the beauty uh, and the challenge of democracies. Look at my own country. Um, this is a, you know, this is an issue for the, the people of Moldova to sort through. Um, there's a responsibility in a democracy to bring together the hearts and minds of a people around a certain vision, a certain strategy, and policies to back that up. Um, as the people of Moldova become clearer in their strategic choice of where they want to see their country, uh, how they want to see it anchored in the transatlantic community and the family of European nations, it gives us something to support and back. Um, I'm concerned about uh, this debate here, in part because I, we've seen efforts to manipulate this from the outside. We've seen the hybrid uh, strategies at, at, uh, in place. Um, we've seen how information has been used, has been weaponized uh, as a way to, to, in many respects, uh, pr promote propaganda, brainwash others um, into thinking about uh, 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 how a relationship with Russia, for example, um, uh, might disingenuously advance their interests. And I think that's why there, this is uh, uh, an important time, a difficult time, and it won't be easy. I think this is a struggle that we have to see the Moldovan people work through themselves. Um, we need to support them in their efforts to protect their democracy and protect their voice here. But we also have to recognize that there are pretty diverse opinions and diverse views here. And it's the messy part of a democracy to figure out how to stitch together these differing approaches and differing opinions into a, a path forward for the country. Um, this, this is a, a key election to, as a signal to the outside world of where Moldova is headed. Um, but that's going to continue. That will continue with each marker, each process, each election that this country goes through. And I think I hope that uh, I bring to this a perspective, not just of what's happening tomorrow, the next day, the next election, but I bring a perspective to this of the medium to long term that if we don't maintain a sense of vision, if we don't have a strategy to get there, if we aren't supporting with the policies that get through, um, uh, I worry about what can happen in this part of Europe. And I think it's in our interest, my interest as, as American, uh, to ensure that there is a sense of peace, security, stability, but also a continued advance of, of freedom. Uh, in this part of the world, because that's how we actually ensure that we aren't going to be faced with a major conflict in which the United States will have to get more, not less, involved. Um, so the stakes are high, but essentially this is a big debate that the people of Moldova themselves will have to have among themselves uh, and resolve among themselves. And we want to be the best partners we can uh, for all the electorate, for all the governments, for all the, the political actors here in that journey. One final question for the last minute of this uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Wilson, what do you think will be the main challenge for Moldova uh, in the few months before the elections? Propaganda, Russian meddling, uh, other kinds of challenges. What do you think will, uh, will be the, the, the major challenge for the future well, period? Well, in many respects, I think, I mean, I am worried about these strategic issues. I am worried about manipulation. We've seen this in the American elections. Uh, if it ha happens in the American elections, you can only imagine what could happen here, where the terrain is more fertile, if you will, for that type of influence. Uh, but I do think at the end of the day, there has to be, you have to bring with you the people. We watched this play out in the United States. Um, the average American voter was concerned about where the country's going and where, how they're doing. And I think that's going to be, at the end of the day, a sense of accountability of the political forces of how do you bring how do people pursue a more positive future for themselves by staying here in Moldova, having the prospects of a job, having the prospects of an education? 
So I think some of these bread and butter issues, are, they're at the forefront of every election. We see this across the world that uh, for geostrategists that get involved in all these issues, at the end of the day, people care about their families, their communities, their own prosperity. That's not going to be any different, I suspect, here in Moldova. Just the overlay to that is that the strategic stakes are high, and we recognize that, and we want to support this process in the right direction. Thank you very much, sir, for having accepted this uh, discussion on the spot, as I've told you before, without any preparation. Um, hope uh, we'll see you again here in better circumstances than these ones. My pleasure. We, uh, we look forward to being back here in Kisinau as the Atlantic Council, but we also look forward to keeping the Atlantic Council's doors open in Washington to all those that are coming from this region, Moldova in particular. I'll just close by saying um, part of what we're doing at the Atlantic Council, the issue, a small issue like Moldova can get lost in the shuffle sometimes in our political debates in Washington. And so what we're trying to do is to help at an American political level, for political leaders to be able to relate to what's happening here, to understand that in many respects, these nations, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, are hostage nations. That because of Russia's effort to hold you back, no matter how successful you are, at home, Russian presence of its forces in these three countries is designed to block your aspirations, to block your future, to hold you hostage. That's a point that I think the American people and American politicians can understand, that it's not only a moral thing to do, a moral cause, the right thing to do, to stand by countries that are being held hostage. Um, it's also in our interest to support you in that process, and that's what we're all about. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. My pleasure being with you. Thanks for the opportunity. Vă mulțumesc dumneavoastră pentru atenție. A fost o ediție Eurodicționar organizată în marja summitului de la Chișinău pe probleme de securitate regională, organizat împreună cu Atlantic Council de către Ucraina, Georgia și Republica Moldova. Chestiuni importante, chestiuni despre care vom mai vorbi pe parcursul acestei emisiuni. Până duminica viitoare, însă, numai bine. La revedere!